Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is week 10 of our, uh, of our online course. For those of you who are academics and are uh, racing to put all of your courses online, um, I'll just point out that this course was way ahead of the curve and everybody around the academic world seems to be running to catch up with us. Um, but here we are, and kind of depending on everybody around the world to um, get their videos done each week. And so I'm very appreciative to the instructors who are kind of racing in a, in a changing world to, to uh, get their assignments done. Um, so we're in week 10, and this was a, an unusual week because the, we had only one talk from Aaron Saup uh, on paleoclimate data. Um, but next week, we essentially have finished up the environmental data section. We go into occurrence data. So I'm going to do an overview. Jorge Soberon will talk about the relationship of occurrence data to theory. And then John Wichorek will talk about sources of occurrence data. And from there, we go into georeferencing with Mona, who's here uh, answering questions today, uh, data cleaning, et cetera, et cetera. So we're kind of moving into the more practical dimensions of, of this topic. Um, we had fewer questions this week than has been our normal. Um, probably because I got the video up one day late. Um, my error, because I, I first exported a video that was 12 hours long instead of a little bit more than a half hour and didn't notice it. There's Marlon joining us. Um, but uh, also probably we had fewer questions because everybody in the world was was racing to to uh, accommodate COVID-19 uh, preventive measures. So um, it's good that, that this was a topsy-turvy week. Um, let's jump into questions. Um, Aaron, do you have particular questions that you want me to go to? Yeah, so I, I have a number of questions that uh, I can answer. And then, of course, you know, we can sort of just pick and choose the rest. Um, give me the line number of the questions you want me to go to. Um, so that is a good question. <laughs> um, I need to figure out the line number. <laughs> or, you can, or you can just tell me the, the, just read the question out loud. That's fine. Yeah. So it says, hello, is there any other paleogeographic data besides climate data? Um, so I was going to address that question. Um, okay. so there's, there's essentially two uh, uh, ways to answer this question. The first is that there are other sources of, of paleoclimate data or paleoenvironmental data. Um, and in my presentation, I talked about making your own environmental layers. Um, and hopefully you, when you do that, you are capturing some information about paleoclimate, but it's certainly not, not the typical paleoclimatic data that you think about as derived from generalized circulation models, so things like temperature and precipitation. So when you're making your own environmental data layers, you are usually taking um, information derived from the sedimentary record and from um, geochemical proxies, so things like delta O18, um, uh, carbon isotopes, um, sediment types, so is it sandstone, is it limestone, um, and then you're inferring the paleoenvironment from those uh, sorts of information, those pieces of information. Um, so in that sense, you know, th there are other ways that you can capture paleoenvironmental information that is not paleoclimate as derived from generalized circulation models. Um, but there are also other uh, ways that you can capture paleoenvironmental conditions in general. Um, and some of those actually go in to generalize circulation models. 
So uh, for example, um, in order to run a generalized circulation model to get out those paleoclimatologies, so to get out things like temperature and precipitation, um, or if you're thinking about the marine realm, um, sea surface temperatures um, or temperatures at depth, salinity, et cetera, uh, we need to have um, fairly accurate or at least our best estimates of the topography and paleogeography of the time period that is being modeled. Um, and so that means that we have to have some sort of understanding of what did, what was the continental configuration in the time period that we're modeling and what was the topography like on land in the time period um, that we are modeling. And so some of you ask questions regarding um, whether you can get those sorts of information to use them in modeling. And the answer is yes, because they're part of generalized circulation models. Um, and we do have some estimates of what uh, continents looked like, where they were located, and what the topography was like, at least at broad scales. Um, and additionally, in those models, so in the generalized circulation models, um, there are broad scale classes of information or, or sort of categories of um, vegetation types. Um, so in those models, you have information about whether it's grassland, whether it's tropical humid forests. And again, if those are um, data layers that could be important for your modeling and for niche, the niches of your species, then that's something you could actually derive and take from, um, from the GCMs themselves. So, um, so, that, so, so, you know, it's not just sort of temperature precipitation and the 19 bioclimatic variables that you can get from these um, GCMs in deep time. You can also get these other climate layers. Um, and then in terms of sort of thinking about, some of you asked about soil types, um, or you could even sort of use pollen types to get at um, uh, and other types of paleoenvironmental information as well. Um, and again, this might involve you doing a bit of more work uh, to build your own layers, to work with sort of paleosol, which is um, a word uh, that it describes sort of paleo uh, soil types. Um, so it might require a bit more work to get at that, um, but you sort of can from the sedimentological record, um, from uh, pollen records, which there are databases of pollen types um, for much of the, the Cenozoic at least. Um, and then you can incorporate that type of information into models if they are relevant to your study question. So, um, so there are other types of data other than strictly sort of temperature precipitation. So just to, to be, just to re-emphasize just a bit, when the big, well, when, when any GCM is being developed as a precursor are needed land sea masks, topographic maps and such, digital elevation models, I should say. Yes. Uh, when they do the big intercomparison projects, like the Pleistocene model in, intercomparison project, PMIP, and there's a plyo MIP and there's a myo MIP. The inputs that are used to all of the models being compared include those topographic data and some other data that might be useful in some cases. And those are there online as part. So if you go to those plyo MIP, P MIP, things like that, you'll see those input data sets for download. The only mm -hmm. thing is they are developed at the at the spatial resolution that is relevant to those models so it's going to have pretty coarse pixels and you may be frustrated with that because all of these gcms are done at very coarse spatial resolutions and if you see beautiful pleistocene um climate layers when you look at you know what you find on world clam or something like that it's because they've been downscaled. And the downscaling may or may not be uh, robust. And in fact, one thing uh, Aaron emphasized, of course, but one thing you have to remember is Pleistocene is relatively easy because most of global topography was in its present conformation. When you go back be a few million years into the past, major changes start happening in the world, like the uplift of the Himalayas or the Andes, the connection of continents, 
cutting off ocean circulation between the Atlantic and the Pacific, things like that. Everything changes. Yes, you can develop GCMs, but the uncertainty levels just go through the roof. Yeah, exactly. Um, and town brings up a, a good point and touches on another question that we received, which is why is it more difficult to model deeper in time um, and for these GCMs to be, um, you know, they have higher uncertainty deeper in time, which is what I mentioned in my presentation. And this is because the boundary conditions, so things like how the continents are configured, um, what was uh, the greenhouse gas levels in ancient atmospheres, so CO2, methane, um, what was the orbital configuration like? All of those um, boundary conditions, which are really important for understanding past climate, um, they're more uncertain. It's more di it's difficult to to know um, precisely what those conditions were, and therefore, if we don't know uh, very well those boundary conditions, then we can't um, as accurately model past climatic conditions. Um, and Town uh, mentioned the fact that you know you have these different um, paleogeographies and you have these different digital elevation models that go into the generalized circulation models, which ultimately then produce estimates of what temperature and precipitation was like on Earth. Um, and what PMIP um, and uh, Deep MIP and uh, and these modeling intercomparison projects do is actually test these various parameters and how they um, affect uh, estimates of climate. Um, and so they will alter and, and test different paleogeographies and especially deeper in time, there's more, as I said, there's more uncertainty regarding those paleogeographies. And so they'll actually um, test the effect of altering and considering different um, hypotheses of the paleogeography and what influence that has on our climate estimates um, for that time period. And so that's what I was trying to say in the presentation, that it's important to use different GCM models um, and to test different paleogeographies in your niche modeling, um, because that will uh, provide a range of uncertainties in our climate estimates for that time period. Um, and some of you asked, like, what is the basis of GCM modeling or generalized circulation modeling? And there's actually a lot of different types of, of generalized circulation models that um, can be run. Um, the most complex is a coupled atmosphere ocean generalized circulation model. Um, and essentially, these are just really complex mathematical models of general circulation of um, planetary atmosphere and oceans. Um, and it includes um, sort of phys the physics of how um, fluids, uh, fluids, fluid motion, um, chemistry, um, and there's lots of differential equations in these models. And essentially they are trying to accu accurately represent how um, Earth's uh, climate system operated both today and in the future, but also in this case and that we're discussing now in the past, given these boundary conditions, which include things like atmospheric greenhouse gas concentrations, the uh, configuration of the continents, which affects how currents flow um, and how currents flow in the ocean and how currents flow on land uh, affects your climate. Um, and so we need to know topography because that will influence again how heat is distributed over the surface of the earth etc so these this gc the gcm models these are done by professional individuals who are focused solely on um, modeling the climate of, of earth um, and other actually planetary bodies as well um, and they can be quite complex um, and for when we're thinking about using them in for our modeling purposes for for niche modeling we actually want to choose those uh, GCM models that, um, that best represent Earth's climate, both either today or in the past, or sort of our best representations of what we think will happen in the future. And generally, those types of models are the, the ones that um, use the most complex uh, systems. So they're coupled atmosphere-ocean models that are considering the ocean and the atmosphere in conjunction with each other. Um, they usually have um, 
um, multiple what are called slabs. So basically they're considering the ocean as a three-dimensional object. Um, and they generally are modeling at the highest resolution possible. Um, and Town mentioned that our understanding of sort of topography, our understanding of climate that in the past, especially as you go deeper in time, it, it's going to have a really coarse resolution. And we're not going to be able to get um, very high resolution like you're used to for world clim in the present day, for example. But now there actually are running, uh, especially regional models um, at higher resolution. So the, the situation is getting better. Um, but when you see sort of downscale paleo climate, usually it is not run at that native resolution. And it's important to consider that. Okay, let's jump to a different set of questions. Um, here's one that is really a foreshadowing of a, a future conversation. I think it's worth, it's worth um, talking about just for a second here. Uh, I have only one question associated with studies. In your examples, when you modeled and projected the niche from to past from present and vice versa, did you permit extrapolation or clamping in the models? If these options are not permitted, this means that novel but reasonable conditions in the projection region will not be identified as suitable. How could this affect your results? Yeah, it's an excellent question. And um, I'm not sure if you have talked yet in this course about extrapolation and clamping. Um, no. um, but essentially, when uh, you are building a model in one geographic region or one time period, and then you are projecting, so transferring that model to a different time period or different geographic region, the model can encounter novel environmental conditions. So essentially conditions that are new that the model hasn't seen before in those, in those different regions or different time periods. So be it the future or the past. Um, and in these situations, uh, it, it, the model doesn't know necessarily what to do with those novel conditions. It doesn't know whether those novel conditions are suitable or unsuitable for the species. And there's a variety of options that those models can do. One of the options is what's called clamping, and this is um, a function in Maxen. And in clamping, essentially, it takes um, the suitability level of um, predicted by the model and essentially just extends, extends that suitability model um, out continuously to any sort of value further afield from that original value. And this is not necessarily realistic, um, and it can be quite problematic. Um, extrapolation is a bit different. Similar sort of concept of dealing with novel values and how does the model assign suitability to those novel values. But it, either, but it um, continues the trajectory of the suitability curve. So if that suitability was sort of decreasing at the last known value, it'll continue to de decrease at um, more extreme values. Or if the suitability was increasing at the last known value um, in your calibration region, it will continue to increase the, the suitability. Um, and so obviously, if you allow extrapolation, if you allow clamping, or if you don't allow any of the um, clamping or extrapolation, it'll affect your projections of what areas um, are suitable for, for those species. Um, and so in, in my study, I tested it under a number of different um, scenarios. So I allowed uh, extrapolation. I didn't allow clamping because we don't think that clamping is a very realistic um, expectation for species niches. But I did uh, run the, my uh, results with both um, extrapolation and not extrapolation. And then I could compare and contrast which areas were projected as suitable um, under those different scenarios. So just to refer back to earlier lectures, you students will remember the difference between the existing niche and the fundamental niche. The existing niche is the reduction of the fundamental niche by what uh, conditions are available to the species over its accessible area. Well, conditions that are just outside or far outside that existing niche may be suitable or not, but we don't have any information about them um, 
in the region where the species has explored. And so when within the conditions available, when the, when the conditions that are used by the species bump up against one edge, it's very hard to guess whether those conditions farther out from that edge are suitable or not. And uh, so that's where you have to make some decisions about how you are going to deal with those more extreme conditions. You can truncate your model and assume that the existing niche is the fundamental. You can assume that the marginal conditions will be the conditions much farther out, that's clamping. Or you can let some modeled shape of a response curve kind of guess at what the species will do in those conditions. It's dangerous because you're basically depending on that modeled shape. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're going to talk a lot about this. And we're also going to have a really neat presentation uh, from Laura Jimenez and Jorge Soberon about a, a new modeling approach where they make assumptions about what is the shape of the response of biological traits like an ecological niche, and then fit response uh, curves or response shapes that match those assumptions. And that is really novel and really important uh, as, as they wrap up that methodology and make it more robust. Okay, another question anybody wants to look at? Um, there were a few questions about uh, the concept of proxy data for model comparisons. And so I thought I'd explain just a bit more about that. Good. Um, proxy data are essentially our best, our, our way of, of using empirical data uh, to estimate what past conditions were like. So examples of proxy data are things like, um, crocodiles, which have, at least today, a fairly constrained um, set of temperatures that they live under. And so we, uh, if we find them in the fossil record, we are making the assumption that um, they lived in certain, in those same temperatures um, in the past. Um, and so what, uh, what um, a paleoclimate modeler will do is they will run their very complex generalized circulation model that is accounting for all of these boundary conditions, like I was talking about, and also accounting for the physics of how um, the atmosphere and the ocean circulate. Um, and they'll come up with um, temperatures for each grid cell of the world. Um, and then what they will do is they will look at whether the temperatures that they predict from their model actually match our uh, climatic proxy data. So like the data on where our crocodiles distributed in the time period that they were modeling. Or for example, what do the oxygen uh, isotopes tell us about past temperature? So we can actually um, look at the geochemistry of fossils and we can um, estimate what the temperature was like at particular points on in Earth um, based on, on um, those isotopic values. And then they can compare those isotopic values uh, um, to what the model, that GCM model is predicting. So essentially these are um, what I meant by proxy model comparisons, um, is sort of testing the uh, climate model um, based on what we actually see in the fossil record and in the sedimentological record. Um, and what we think climate was was actually like based on sort of empirical data um, and does it match that climate data from the GCMs. Um, and some of you were interested in an example of this. Um, and I, I pointed you to the deep MIP uh, website. Um, and in that deep MIP website, you can go to uh, the paper section um, and they have a paper that they are just publishing now which is on model intercomparison of, early, of the early Eocene climatic optimum. Um, and they're comparing their climatic features that they've modeled to the proxy data that we have for that time period. So that's a, if you're interested in that topic, this is a good example of this. Maybe another, another set of proxies that uh, people will see pretty frequently would be pollen data. Yes, absolutely. Yep. 
And we've mm -hmm. talked about pollen data before. Um, so those types of pollen data are often used to validate paleoclimate models. Okay, other questions? Uh, this is a bit cheeky, but there's a question of, could you please point out a paper you uh, especially liked on paleoclimate data and past latitudinal diversity gradients? And uh, I was going to point to a paper that Town and I published along with some of our co-authors, including Jorge Soboron, uh, Corey Myers, and Huey Chow, um, that used paleoclimate model data for the last 120,000 years um, to generate a null model uh, for the latitudinal diversity gradient. Essentially, it um, simulated a virtual world uh, based on this paleoclimate model data. And it said, can we actually generate a latitudinal diversity gradient um, from nothing, from no latitudinal diversity gradient? But just assuming that species have some niches and those niches interact with climate and structure where species can live in space. Um, and we modeled speciation and extinction in this model. Um, and we were able to generate latitudinal diversity gradients. Um, so I would point you to that paper, which is published in- I'll, I'll put um, it online. Yeah, Tom's gonna put it online. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty, yeah, again, cheeky, but um, pretty <laughs> neat piece of work because if you look at the dozens of hypotheses that have been advanced to explain essentially why there are more species in the tropics and why there are fewer species at high latitudes, um, a lot of the explanations invoke interactions amongst species. More intense competition in one region or another, um, exclusion, uh, need for specialization, but it, it, a lot of them come back to interactive explanations. And what we did, well, what Kui Jie Chiao did in the virtual, simu virtual world simulations that he developed was to exclusive, exclude from the simulations on purpose any idea of interactions. And so all our, our species do is they track their niches and they speciate when they experience disjunctions. And they, they're basically distributed according to real world climatic patterns and climatic fluctuations, but they don't ever interact. And so we built a world that excludes one major set of phenomena that have been posited to affect um, latitudinal diversity gradients. And what we found is that you get these really realistic um, gradients, even when there are no species interactions. I'll put that online in the, in the um, you guys know where this is, but in the additional materials box, okay? So it'll be here in a little bit. Um, other questions? There is, a, I think, a simple question or a question that can be answered fast. Uh, line 1537. You mentioned multiple databases with paleoclimate information. Is there any database that you would say is the more complete or has more precise data? And I'm assuming the answer is based on the uncertainty of various <laughs> uh, GCMs and <laughs> reconstructions, you should probably not rely on a single one, but I'll, I'll <laughs> let you answer that. Yeah, I mean, I think Mona is right in that um, I'm going to reiterate what I said in my presentation is that it depends on your question and it depends on your study system and you should um, be comparing as many different types of paleoclimate data as possible when you are uh, performing your niche modeling analyses. Um, because as we've been talking about, there are more uncertainties with paleoclimate estimates. And so if you can run your, your models, your niche models, using multiple different estimates of past climate, you can then see how much your results and your analyses vary depending on the type of climate model that you use. Um, in, the, in the presentation as well, I also talked about the fact that the different databases um, have different types of data. 
So some of them have taken um, the raw sort of paleoclimate GCM outputs and converted them into the 19 standard bioclimatic variables that are used. And that's quite useful if you are interested in terrestrial systems um, and you're interested in precipitation and temperature variations. Um, but if you're interested in the marine realm, then maybe you need to look at paleo -Mar spec, for example. Um, if you're interested in really deep time questions, so pre sort of um, Pliocene, then you'll need to focus on different databases um, than sort of Pleistocene, which is Holocene, Pleistocene, those are quite common past climate time periods. And there's lots of different models available and lots of different sources um, where you can acquire those data. So um, the answer is sort of, it, it, it depends. <laughs> so, so it's worth emphasizing, and this has been said by Aaron, and by by others in the in the climate data talks what these gcms do is they are a simulation of how the different components of the earth interact to create climate they're not tuned to any time all they are is um, essentially a simulation of of how the the geosphere, the atmosphere, the ocean interact to create climate, and so when when a GCM is going to be tuned to let's say the future climate 2010, 2050, 2100, or when it's going to be set for last glacial maximum or the Miocene or whenever. Essentially what's being done is, is they're taking the atmospheric composition, plugging those parameter values into their model and letting their model equilibrate, essentially letting the model settle down to those initial conditions and then run the model for 30 or 50 years as if it were weather around the world sample that and summarize that. And so yeah. none of these is a prediction, none of these is precise, and none of these is correct. They are scenarios. They're essentially just saying, what if the environmental composition looked like this? Okay? Yeah, but so... Each of those, sorry, each of those GCMs is a different simulation. They'll have different kinds of connections between different elements of the earth. And so they'll work a little bit different. And so the neat thing about the intercomparison projects is they all start with the same input data. And so the differences you see are the differences between the simulations. Yeah, Tan's exactly right. Um, and in addition to to changing the uh, atmospheric concentrations of those greenhouse gases, if you're modeling further back in time, for example, the Pliocene or deeper, then they're also going to be changing those digital elevation models and um, the continents as well. Um, and that will influence uh, circulation patterns, both on land and in the, and in the sea. Um, and, and Town is also right that they're just models. So they're just estimates of past climatic conditions, um, and similarly, if you're thinking about the future, future climatic conditions. But I would remind everyone that actually most of what we do is just models, um, including niche models. So we have to be really careful uh, in interpreting anything we do, including our niche models, including just simple statistical analyses we do, like a t-test. All of that is actually a model and an estimate of how we try to characterize and understand the natural world and the processes occurring in the natural world. Let's look at this question that, that's online. Uh, at what minimum scale is it possible to model the distribution of a species considering the uncertainties that GCMs can generate? So usually, you guys know, I hate the questions about how many points do I need or what's the finest scale I can go. But this is an interesting one because I think there's a, there's a dimension of responsibility of not over-interpreting things. The GCMs have a spatial resolution that ranges between, in the very best of cases, a half a degree up to several degrees. 
okay? Yeah, there are regional climate models which have their own complications that can go finer. But those GCMs that we're all using because they're global, um, they do not get finer at this point with current levels of computing. They don't get finer than 50 or 100 or several hundred kilometers resolution. Most of the time they run at 2.75 by 3.75 degrees. And then anything you have that's finer than that has been downscaled um, statistically after that initial climate model has actually been generated. Exactly. And, and maybe, maybe remind uh, participants about degree, what is it in case that is not commonly used? Uh, so yes, yeah, so one degree. Go ahead. One degree is um, about 100 kilometers at the equator. So this is a really coarse scale um, model uh, of, of the Earth's climate, um, both in the ocean and on land. And so, yes, it, those native resolutions, um, so what the climate model has actually been run on, can be downscaled to one degree, so that's 100 kilometers or finer, but those are basically um, just sort of representations of that native resolution. You're not actually gaining more information when you're doing that downscaling. So let's take this farther. My feeling is these paleo transfers of models should only be done at very broad geographic extents. There's essentially no justification for developing these models across small extents and certainly not for interpreting them. There's a, there's a paper, I'm not going to put it online because I don't want to single it out for, for you know, kicking a dead horse, but there's a paper saying um, Mesoamerican tree distributions show no refugia in Mesoamerica um, at the last glacial maximum. And if you look at Mesoamerica, it's this pretty small a uh, narrow thing that goes in an odd um, orientation, it ends up being the crucial regions that were treated in that paper end up being like two pixels, but big, huge pixels that are uh, a couple hundred kilometers across. And so how could you imagine picking out a climate refugium, some valley or some uh, basin that maintained suitable conditions. You're not going to be able to see it. And it's, it's kind of unfortunate that a paper like that was published because it really misrepresents and overinterprets the amount of information that was actually present in the data. So Again, I think this, is, this question is more relevant than the usual, you know, how many points do I need to fit a niche model? Because there actually is a right answer here. You should be interpreting broad scale geographic phenomena that don't depend on one or two pixels and that, that actually still have some detail even if your pixels are 100 kilometers across. Yeah, I think Tom's, I think Tom's right. Um, you know, you may be able to get more regional climate models that are slotted in to these um, global climate models and they can model climate at a higher resolution. And in that case, you know, if you have sort of a more regional scale question, maybe that's okay. But in general, I think with paleoclimate question or paleo paleontological questions rather using paleoclimate data, you need to think about um, having sort of a more macro scale, broad scale um, question and not over interpreting um, in very small regions. Um, because as I said, most of these climate models that you will get if they're global in scale are run at 3.75 by 2.5 degree resolution, native resolution. There was a question about uh, method to interpolate variables to a smaller scale than, th than they are. And so that's related to what we were talking that don't do that. <laughs> uh. Well, mo a lot, yeah, most of, most of the databases that I actually mentioned have um, down, 
scale the native resolution of these climate models, usually to one degree, um, but sometimes finer as well. And there's a lot of different ways that you can downscale and interpolate to a finer re resolution. Uh, the climate, um, at, and they talk about it in the actual uh, data packages. So I would just recommend looking at what they actually did to downscale their models. Mm -hmm. Be aware that your data are really um, coarse resolution data that are dressed up as fine resolution data. And there's a, there's a difference between just interpol interpolating in ArcGIS and downscaling the model. So yeah. Yeah. that's the big problem. Downscaling models, I, you know, I agree with that. People are trying to improve the models, regional downscale, but when people just take an output from a model, from a GCM, and then interpolate to some some really and and some really small small resolution, fine resolution. We should also be yeah careful about scale because scale has is grain and extent and down address both. The fact that you can have a small extent with two pixels <laughs> with coarse resolution. Anyways, so. Yeah, I think um, that's a really good point that Mona made is that um, interpolating from sort of a raw output, just sort of an ArcGIS uh, using say bilinear methods or, or Euclidean distance or something like that, that's very different than um, uh, downscaling using fairly sophisticated techniques, which a lot of these um, climate model outputs that I talked about have done. Um, and they discuss in detail in their methodology. So there's no, on the WorldClim website right now, Tom, there's no paleoclimate data anymore. Um, there is, there is, it's at the end. Go at the end. And it says, it says the versions, supersede version one there, exactly. And then uh, go. So this is the old version then. Uh-huh. Those, those are the old versions in size oh, paleoclimate. Oh, then you can find it there. Okay. Yeah. So, no. Notice thirty arc seconds of resolution. So that's about a kilometer. So mm -hmm. what you're saying is you're taking a pixel. It is probably at the very, very best ten thousand square kilometers, and you're interpolating it down to single square kilometers but it's probably actually quite a bit worse like like um three well, degrees so, yeah, so they probably downscaled in this if you click here downscaled and calibrated bias corrected so in the first paragraph i guess it will tell us how they did that i assume it's by delta method Data available here were produced with a method that is simple and quick. That's a bad sign. Mm. So essentially, I, I can explain this um, pretty easily. In your GCM models, you would have a present day and you would have, let's say, last glacial maxima. You take a difference between those, and it's a difference at a coarse spatial resolution. And so you have these big blocks that say, you know, maybe temperature decrease of two degrees, temperature decrease of 2.3 degrees, things like that. But those are coarse resolution. So what you do is you take that change coverage and you smooth it and you smooth it at a very fine spatial resolution. Then you go to the present data for which we have good detail. Okay, those are the present day world CLIM coverages. You go to those present day data and you say, I'm gonna add my change coverage to the fine resolution present day climate data. And so essentially what you're assuming is that the degree of change is constant and that it was reasonable to smooth the degree of change, but 
you're assuming that the present day relationships hold in the past. It's got a thousand um, assumptions in it. My own feeling is you might use it to get a you know, five or ten fold increase in resolution, but not a hundreds fold increase in resolution. So if I use these data, I'm going to use them at the coarsest resolution I possibly can. And to use coarse resolution paleo data, what I want to do is work with species that have big distributions in the past. One thing uh, I think we haven't said yet is that uh, from all what you have here, it's important to consider the uh, database you are using because if you take current variables from Workclim, they are not they are probably not it's not it's probably not suitable to project those models created with those data to a paleo climate variable set of variables that is from a different database unless that database is also using uh, the same original data or so the, yeah. yeah we talked yeah no I, uh, that's that's a good point so you, obviously if you are building a model in one time period let, let's say it's the present and you're using say the bioclim world clim variables to do so then when you project that model to a different time period um say the past or even the future you'll obviously want to use the same uh bioclimatic variables that are representing those past or future conditions and um a lot of the databases that i talked to you about have those bioclimatic data variables available so you can from the paleoclimate models they've um, derived the same bioclimatic variables or world climate variables for the present i think it's a it's a nitpicking detail um that i'm i'm continuing uh, marlon's idea but the baseline data have to be the same between current past and future uh, so if you use world clean uh, reconstruction of the past then you also have to use world clean current or historical or baseline data so you can't use world clean baseline data and then you know future from some other website that use a different baseline mm -hmm. to generate those GCM outputs. I think, but that's, yeah, that's a bit getting into very small detail. And town is running out of time. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Uh, there's a paper that I'll put online. Um, let's see, oh, come on. Well, here, I just don't <laughs> Uh, but it's essentially a, a paper from a research group in, in Brazil. Um, and what they demonstrate, let's see. Uh, I think this is it. What they demonstrate is that by, um, by using, remember I told you that we can, we can use um, fine resolution present day data those fine resolution present day data do not come from the GCM. They come from weather stations. And so what's argued in this paper, which I think is a very important paper, is that we are therefore underestimating the true variation in these paleoclimate model outputs because we've essentially anchored them all to the same present day data set artificially. And so what they argue is that we should use the present day data at the native resolution, the present day course outputs from each GCM, because each of those present day outputs is different from one GCM to another. And if that's true, then I think what we're going to see is huge model to model variation. And uh, so I'll, I'll put this paper online uh, for you all to read. 
Because uh, we talked about in my presentation, eco climate, um, we, I pointed you to this uh, database, which has the 19 bioclimatic variables. So it would be a good paper to read to accompany um, that data set. Uh, but it's a, it's a serious drawback to big time um, model transfers. So take, take a look at that paper. Any last question, last thoughts, guys? No. Okay, well, thank you, Aaron. You were the star of the week. Um, thanks, Mona and, and Marlon. And we'll see you guys next week when we talk about uh, occurrence data. Great. Okay. Thank you, Town. Everybody have a good week. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. All right.